Hi, I'm Jonathan Edwards, and I want to welcome you to the Jed Breaks Bread podcast. My goal in this podcast is to teach the truth of the Word of God and apply it to our lives that our orthopraxy might be as good as our orthodoxy. May you be blessed. Well, as a follow-up to last week's discussion on what is the true truth and defining presuppositions and explaining how presuppositions form the foundation for all thinking and thought processes that people have, that presuppositions are the filter for the way people interpret life, you would think that the natural question that people would ask is, well, how do I, how do I get the right presuppositions? You know, if presuppositions are so important, how do I get the right ones? What are the right ones? I think that's a legitimate, good, reasonable question to ask. And I think it was addressed very well in the Gospels by Jesus. In John chapter 8, we find Jesus talking to his disciples and some who had believed in him and also the Pharisees who were present. And here's a verse that people enjoy quoting, I think, out of context. It's John chapter 8, verse 32. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now, people love that verse. Yes, if we know the truth, the truth will make us free. You know, they quote that verse but that's only half of the sentence that Jesus spoke. What's the other half of the sentence? If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. What is the condition for having the truth that makes you free? What's the condition? It's a conditional sentence. Did you pick that up? If you continue in my word. If you continue in my word. That means if you pay attention to everything that Jesus spoke, if you not just quote Jesus when it's convenient for you and when it makes life easy for you, but if you quote Jesus when it makes things hard for you, if you quote Jesus when it makes things challenging for you, then then you have a handle on truth. Then the truth could really legitimately make you free. It frustrates me to no end that people who are supposedly Christians use, how do I say this? They use really bad logic. Okay, there's no, there's no nice way to say it, I guess. They use really bad logic to allow Jesus to support their bad behavior. I was just reading an article today by somebody who professes to be a Christian. They're on a popular television show and they're talking about having premarital sex. And this girl says, you know what? Jesus loves me and he, he accepts me for that. He's fine. No, no big deal. I immediately thought back to my time in college where I was in an argument with this one girl who claimed to be Catholic. And we were having a discussion over her relationship with her boyfriend. And I said, well, you're telling me you're a Christian, but you're, you know, sleeping with this guy. You can't do that. Okay. Well, don't judge me. All right. I'm not judging you. That's not my goal. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. What's fascinating is she brought up the whole situation earlier in this very chapter about the woman who was caught in adultery, who was dragged out by the Pharisees and brought before Jesus and the uh, Pharisees were like, this woman was caught in adultery. She should be stoned. We should stone her. And Jesus writes something in the sand and says, he who is without sin cast the first stone. And they all thought about it for a while and they left. This is kind of a rough paraphrase. But you know what? 
Jesus didn't stop the conversation right there after those guys left. In fact, let me read that to you. Exactly his words. Jesus says, uh, Woman, where are these people? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. Is that it? Jesus, okay, fine, no big deal. Go back, do whatever you want to do. I love you. So if it makes you happy to have an adulterous relationship, go back and do that. That's fine. Absolutely great. I love you. Is that what Jesus said to her? No. No, Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go. From now on, sin no more. You know, Jesus did love that woman. He displayed mercy upon her in a way that only God can display mercy. But he also challenged her to practice the truth. I don't condemn you right now, but go and sin no more. That's what's frustrating. People want the true truth. People want to quote Jesus as a source of truth and use Jesus as a reason or the justification for why they can commit all kinds of gross immorality and perversion, why they can do all kinds of things. And it just boils back to like, Jesus loves you. I mean, it's as if the only thing that they know about Jesus is the children's song, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. That's absolutely true. But if you reduce Jesus to a children's song, then you have totally and completely missed the purpose for why Jesus came and what Jesus will do in the future. I mean, Jesus loves you enough to pay the price for your sin. He suffered on the cross for that very fact, for that very purpose. And He has been given all authority by the Father to exact judgment on everyone who rejects him and does not practice the truth. So yeah, Jesus loves you. Perhaps Jesus isn't quote-unquote condemning you in the moment. But if you don't repent from your sins, trust me, there will be a day when Jesus will lower the hammer of justice and it will be an eternal punishment that you face. So how do we get to this point? How do we get to this point where people who are supposedly Christians are quoting Jesus out of context and using the words of Jesus to commit acts of immorality um, that are clearly forbidden in Scripture? I mean, like, you just read the Bible literally, and you should become, should be able to come away with the fact that, you know what, sexual relationship, that's reserved for marriage. That's not something you do outside of marriage. How do we get to that point? Because Jesus is God, and because he was led by the Holy Spirit in a unique way, because he had the divine mind, Jesus was able to have insight and to make connections that we wouldn't be able to make under our own power or ability. And so Jesus begins talking about this concept of the truth with his disciples, some who had believed in him, and the Pharisees were there. Now, the Pharisees were not too keen on this particular discussion. They thought that they were already free. And they said, well, we're we're from Abraham. You know, we've never been slaves, forgetting the 400-year captivity that they had in the nation of Egypt, forgetting also the fact that the Assyrians came away and took the northern 10 tribes of Israel in around 700 BC, and forgetting the fact that Nebuchadnezzar had three separate raids on the southern kingdom of Judah uh, between 515 and 585 BC, and that they were there in captivity for 70 years before Cyrus arose and allowed them to come back. So these Jews, they really needed a history lesson. They were prideful. They were arrogant. They really wanted to put Jesus in his place. 
And so they start criticizing, you know, his teaching, saying, well, we've, we're descendants of Abraham. We've never been slaves. That's just not true. Now, Jesus has more of an issue with the fact that they claim to be Abraham's descendants than the fact that they claim to be set free. What's interesting is that Jesus takes that phrase, Abraham's descendants, and he applies the appropriate spiritual meaning to that phrase. That Abraham's descendants would be those who had the faith like Abraham. Those who believed in Yahweh like Abraham believed in Yahweh. And Jesus pointed out very clearly that the Pharisees who were speaking against him were not Abraham's descendants spiritually. They may have been his descendants in the flesh, but they were not his descendants spiritually. And so these men said, you know, Abraham is our father, and they began, they began to become indignant with him. And Jesus says, no, no, you guys are doing the deeds of your father, not Abraham. Then they get real mad. And they start to say, well, we're not born of fornication, knowing that Jesus was born before Mary and Joseph were legally married. So this was a personal dig at Jesus. And they say, we have one father, God. Jesus replies, you know what? If God were really your father, you would love me, for I came out of God. I've not come on my own initiative, but God sent me. And here's the real truth about the Pharisees. Here's the real truth about the author behind the lies and the deception. You are of your father, the devil. This was the Pharisees. And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Now let's take a step back and look at the big picture of what's going on in this particular passage and how it applies to our current cultural situation. The devil, Satan, the serpent, who is there in Genesis chapter 3, who is present in the world now, who has, according to Paul, the ability to be the ruler over this world to the extent that God allows him to be the ruler. He has two characteristics. Number one, he's a murderer. And number two, he's a liar. His very nature, his very character is that of being a liar. So these Pharisees, they were representative. And they stand today as representatives of anyone who takes the word of God and mixes it with man's tradition or man's ideas and presents it then as something that must be followed in order to be pleasing to God. We think of the Pharisees as legalists, and, and it's true. They, they added works to the law in order to declare, this is how a person gets to heaven. This is how a person is pleasing to God. This is how you practice faith. But I would propose to you this that any so-called Christian who takes the word of God and compromises the literal meaning of the word of God is standing in the same line as a descendant of the Pharisees who themselves were descendants of the devil. Now that could get you in some hot water, but do you think about it? What was the problem with the Pharisees? They had God's truth. They were the ones who were entrusted with the scriptures, and yet they did not understand the word of God. They interpreted it in a way that would benefit them and be a detriment to everybody else. They interpreted it in a way that allowed them honor 
prestige and glory and was really a burden to everybody else in society. Now you think about some of the, I don't even want to say evangelical leaders, but there's some evangelical leaders who have done this. Let's say some so-called Christian leaders over the past 20 years, 15 years, 40 years, I don't know how long you want to make it. Any Christian leader who says, you know what? One thing that we really need to do is figure out how we can put man's ideas together with the Bible to come up with some greater form of truth, some greater form of knowledge. That's what we got to do. That person, that person is acting, maybe not directly, but indirectly, under the influence of Satan, because you cannot wed a lie to truth. You cannot wed a lie to truth. And one thing that our culture has done successfully, and one thing that Satan has been very successful at, is letting people create their own truth. And so the truth, when you talk to somebody who is not a Christian, when you you talk to some people who are Christians, but let's just deal with non-Christians first. When you talk to them, they have a truth that has been set free from any mooring. Now, you all know what a mooring is, right? Out in the ocean, a harbor, you have a point in the water that is anchored, and there is a rope on that anchor. And you pull your ship up, and during the high tide, the mooring keeps your boat from floating off. And during the low tide, obviously, the boat rests on the ocean floor. But when the water comes back in, the mooring keeps the boat from drifting away from shore. Well, Satan has successfully, because he is the father of lies, convinced an entire culture of people to abandon the Judeo-Christian mooring that they once held to. And so there is no foundation for truth any longer. And you go back and you think about, why do we have people with such poor and bad presuppositions? It's because there is no mooring, no foundation for truth. It's not anchored to anything. You can believe whatever you want to believe, but just don't tell me that there's some kind of absolute, which is such an oxymoronic statement anyways. I mean, if you're saying there is no absolute truth, well, that's an absolute. Obviously, that's been pointed out many times. But the fact of the matter is, either there's absolutes or there's not absolutes. Either there's real truth, true truth, or there's nothing. We're we're survival of the fittest. Why are we being altruistic? Why are we being kind? Why are we caring about other things? We should just live for ourselves and enjoy life to the best of our abilities, and then just die, because you know what? That's what evolution gave us. So if you want to say there's no truth, then don't place any burdens or restrictions or limits on anybody else, because whatever they feel like, whatever they desire to do, that's good for them. That's good for them. Let them do it. Who cares? What harm comes to somebody else? We are living under an evolutionary world system. Now, I would imagine that that statement would rub some people the wrong way. It would rub even unbelievers the wrong way. All right? Even unbelievers who maybe, you know, have very little church or experience, like they have uh, hardly any church background, maybe they're not even versed in philosophy, something about that statement doesn't seem right. And we know what it is. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 2 that God has given every man a conscience. And because every man has a conscience, there is an inherent and intrinsic understanding that there are moral rights and moral wrongs in society. God designed that when he created man in his image. Now, just because you have a conscience doesn't mean your conscience is going to give you uh, biblical direction. You see, a conscience is only as good as its training. A conscience can be seared. In other words, 
your conscience could tell you that lying is wrong, but by lying over and over and over and over and over again, you sear your conscience so that your conscience approves of lying. Your conscience can be overtrained to the point where you're way too sensitive to sin. You think things are sin that really aren't sin. Your conscience can be undertrained, which means it's just not well developed. You know, it's inconsistent. And then obviously, the final category would be a biblical conscience, a biblically trained conscience, which is what we should all be striving to achieve as Christians. A biblically trained conscience requires consistent study of the Word of God, consistent interpretation of the Word of God, and a literal interpretation of the Word of God. Well, let's go back to the culture a minute. If we go back to our example of mooring, all right, our culture has no mooring for truth anymore. And so where does that leave you if God has given you this device called a conscience and you have no mooring for truth? You begin to develop a conscience that basically is hedonistic. And when we use that word hedonistic, we're talking about it's a conscience that approves whatever feels good to you. It may not be great for everybody else, but it proves what feels good to you. And here's the bottom line about why this is important to understand. Because we have no absolutes, people who are not believers do not see any inconsistencies when they say, you should be tolerant of somebody who's LGBT. You should be tolerant of them, but I don't want you to foist your religious views upon me. And now maybe that's not the clearest way to say it, but I think you understand what I'm trying to say. They have no problem confirming, supporting, and speaking boldly double standards when it comes to logic and truth because they have no mooring for their truth. Their logic is circular. Their reasoning is incomplete. And so where do you go? Well, they have the truth, quote unquote, set free. They have the truth set free. And when you have the truth set free, it's like riding the wind. It just goes wherever it goes. It goes according to the majority of popular opinion. And it has really basically done like an avalanche effect here in the last 10 years in our society. You know, you, you start an avalanche with maybe a little snowball, a little rock that falls, and it starts gaining up speed, and it starts breaking off pieces of snow, bigger pieces, bigger chunks. And before you know it, you know, an entire mountainside of snow is rushing down on and just fl flattening, leveling everything in its path. That's exactly what's going on with our culture. Because outrage, anger at anything that places some type of restriction on a person is all the rage. That's what everybody wants to do. Pun intended, of course. Pun intended. To be outraged at every little tiny perceived offense is the only way to be heard in our culture. And so we do have the truth set free. We have the truth set free from any mooring, from any logical foundation. We have the truth set free from any um, like background or philosophy. It's just, it's a free for all. And it is exhausting to live in. It is exhausting to think through. It is quite frankly, going to collapse upon itself because more and more people are just going to realize like th this can't continue. The path that we're on can't continue. Like there's no, there aren't any more things to be offended about. Well, Satan, Satan is masterful because he has the blind leading the blind and he has blinded their eyes to understanding and knowing the truth. The fact of the matter is, the truth is really only set free when it's found in Christ. You want peace, satisfaction, joy, 
happiness, fulfillment? Do you want those things for your life? Do you want an absence of conflict? Absence of anger? Absence of frustration? I think whether you're a believer, unbeliever, you could say, yeah, I want those things. Okay, well, how do you get them? Well, if you continue in the word of Jesus, it's all there. It's contained within the 66 books of the word of God. Now, that doesn't make it easy. And we'll be honest, there's probably a lot of Christians who know a lot of facts about the Bible, but have a hard time putting it into practice for various reasons. But you want the truth set free. Okay, you can have the truth set free. But that starts, the truth set free starts with repentance from personal sin. Surrender to the person of Jesus Christ. Believing the message that he brought, that he died on the cross to pay for the sins of the whole world, and that whoever believes in him might have eternal life. That's where the truth starts. And once that happens, once you have had the truth set free because you know Christ, then you have the incredible privilege of having the Holy Spirit dwell inside of you and empower you and enable you to put the truth into practice in your own life. You know, I find it amazing in my own personal life when The days just are a struggle. Maybe you, uh, maybe I'm, you know, too short with my kids, too short with my wife, easily, easily frustrated. Lord willing, at some point during the day, I'll sit back and reflect, why am I like this? Oh, you know what? I haven't spent the time today in prayer, asking the Holy Spirit to fill me, to do his work, to think godly thoughts, to have godly reactions. And when I do that, it, it does make a difference in my life. It helps me to practice the truth. It's so easy to become too busy to take that time in prayer, in reading, in study, to really put the truth to work in your heart. What's amazing and seemingly contradictory is that in Jesus, you can have the truth set free. But that's at the exclusion of every other so-called truth that man tries to peddle. Look, there's only one way. There's only one truth. I mean, that's the definition of truth. It, it's a set of facts that is real. And every other set of facts is false. So we have truth. Truth in Jesus Christ. Truth set free through Jesus Christ. Don't use Jesus as a crutch to get what you want, to ease your conscience by manipulating or twisting the word of God. That's not true truth. That's not truth set free. That's Satan's way of using truth. He takes a little bit of a lie and a little bit of truth and he puts it together and says, here you go. Doesn't this feel good? And that first bite is so satisfying, Eve. You cannot wait to try that first bite. It's so good. And then the best part is you'll be just like God. And Christians, we've been falling for that scheme for over 6,000 years. Stop it. Just stop it. Just read the word of God literally. If it says no sexual immorality, then don't commit sexual immorality. If it says don't lie, then don't lie. If it says be gentle, learn what gentleness is and then practice that. 
These things are not complicated. They're difficult, but they're not complicated. There's a difference. So in a culture that is searching for truth, in a culture that has lost its truth moorings, Christians ought to be a light to that culture because we cling to the Word of God as the only source of true truth. But more than clinging to the Word of God, the testimony of our lives ought to be so upright and pure. The testimony of our lives ought to produce salt and light. Obviously, you can't help it when people wrongly malign you, and Jesus said that would happen. But a lot of the persecution that Christians have suffered have been, has been self-inflicted, and we ought to be ashamed of that. Myself included. Would you do something for me? Would you really take some time to think about if you're practicing the true truth? You know, maybe there's something that you know to be true from the Word of God that you just, you just have a hard time doing that. Or you just don't want to do it. Or you think it's going to be too uncomfortable. Spend some time in prayer about that issue. Ask God to strengthen you. That you might glorify Him in your practice of the truth. That you might be a great representative for the truth set free. Because the truth is found in Jesus Christ, the only one who can save us from our sins. I know these are some deep thoughts, and uh, you know maybe somebody out there is listening and really wants some prayer or some more encouragement or some gu- biblical guidance on how to handle these things. You can contact me. Uh, just in the subject line, put Jonathan. Send me an email at Grace Brethren, that's B R E T H R E N, chapel at gmail.com. That's Jonathan in the subject line at Grace Brethren Chapel at gmail.com. Find us on the web at www.gbchapel.org. Hopefully, in the next couple of weeks, I'll be bringing you some interviews that I'm going to do with some of our uh, denomination missionaries, our fellowship missionaries, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, We're going to our national conference here coming up uh, this this week. I'm leaving tomorrow, actually, for that. And so looking forward to a great time there and encouragement. I'm in charge of the children's conference, so if you think about it, pray for me that I'll do a good job communicating to 5- to 12-year-olds. That's not my forte, but it's... uh, it's going to be a, it's been a great learning experience preparing the lessons and getting ready to do that. So uh, just pray for me that I'll be a good communicator. Thanks again to the Eslor Music Group for their work in behind the scenes production on this podcast. You can check them out on Facebook or email them at eslor.musicgroup at gmail.com. If you need any in home studio writing, recording, or mixing, Thank you, everyone, and God bless.